reactions of a carboxylic acids. Uh, carboxylic acids can decarboxylate to give uh, an alkyne in the simplest forms, uh, but there is one decarboxylation which we will visit later, and that's for a particular kind of carboxylic acid. When we have a carbonyl group in the beta position, this decarboxylation uh, occurs at relatively low temperatures. We don't have to heat them very high and they spontaneously decarboxylate to give di carbon dioxide and in most cases a ketone, uh, depending on what this R group is, ketone or aldehyde. This reaction occurs quite readily because it can form this cyclic transition state uh, where we can very easily uh, have our proton go from being on the uh, carboxylic acid and getting transferred over to the ketone group and we keep moving our electrons uh, and we decarboxylate and we get this thing called an enol. As we will learn later, enols are not very stable and they like to uh, rearrange to become ketones typically with this equilibrium lying very far on the side of the ketone. We'll talk about this later when we talk about the reactivity of the alpha carbon in aldehydes and ketones. Another reaction which we've already seen is the reduction by lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, lithium aluminum hydride is a strong reductant. Uh, initially, a hydride reacts with the acidic hydrogen on a carboxylic acid to form hydrogen gas and a carboxylate, but that carboxylate can still be reduced uh, by very strong reducing reagents. Remember, we couldn't do this with sodium borohydride, but we can do it with lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, we initially formed this complex between the oxygen atom of our carboxylate and the aluminum and at the same time that hydride is transferred uh, to the carbon uh, we can this can then dissociate to give an aldehyde the aldehyde is also very reactive towards lithium aluminum hydride and we get further reduction of the aldehyde uh, and then upon final workup uh, remember we would add this after the reaction is completed and we would have these aluminum alkoxides, a very complex mixture, but we can work it up and release the product as a primary alcohol. But a more important reaction, and one we're going to look at in quite a lot of detail, in both directions actually, is this reaction known as the Fischer esterification. So in this reaction, the first step, we can do this under uh, acidic conditions, the first step of the reaction is a simple protonation and as it turns out this is the most basic uh, site of a carboxylic acid so that's what will get protonated and we just get in a protonation and now we have this protonated carboxylic acid. This thing is quite a good acid, even a much better acid than its precursor so the, it, the reaction can go back but every once in a while we're going to get a collision in which the between the an alcohol and the protonated carboxylic acid where we get a position for a rearrangement to occur of the electrons in which we attack the carbonyl carbon uh, because it is quite an electrophilic carbon as well and then we get this species now this protonated species these reactions are all under equilibrium conditions and the position of equilibrium we'll talk about at the end uh, we get this protonated, uh, highly oxygenated carbon species. And now if we think about it, it can go back. But if we were to, sorry, if we were to uh, move one of these protons, something will come along and remove this proton, and we could put it on either one of these oxygens. Uh, so we just get a proton shift. When that proton shift occurs, you'll notice that now, uh, although it can go back, we can see that we're setting it up to remove the elements of water. Uh, you'll notice I've added electron pairs on this oxygen atom, so that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start at one of these electron pairs uh, and push off my water. The water could come off uh, and 
we get this species. This is uh, a protonated ester. Uh, there we have the carbonyl group, and the carbonyl carbon is bonded to an oxygen. It's protonated. We can draw a resonance structure for this uh, by just re having these electrons move up, in which we have the positive charge on the carbon, carbonyl carbon. So that positive charge is delocalized between the oxygen and the carbon. Now, water was our other product here, and what we can do is use the water to deprotonate the ester, and we get our final products, which is just uh, an ester. Uh, we get a molecule of water. It's showing here as a protonated form. Uh, our product is an ester, and uh, this reaction is acid catalyzed because the last step regenerates that acid that we had up here. But the actual products are the ester and a molecule of water. So this is how we can form esters from carboxylic acids. And in fact, an ester is just a carboxylic acid derivative. There's a lot of different kinds of carboxylic acid derivatives, and they're all quite similar, and they differ uh, by what the groups are, but they're also, good, as we're going to see, differ in the reactivity. So carboxylic acids can be derivatized into their derivatives, in which we have an acyl group, and we replace the OH with something. We're going to call it a leaving group. Remember, uh, that's very similar to a nucleophile. Uh, when it's on here, uh, we call it a leaving group because it can leave. And what we're going to find is that we can do reactions at the carbonyl carbon. When we form our tetrahedral intermediate, we now have a group that can leave. So the Carboxylic acid derivatives we're going to be interested in, for the most part, are up here. The acyl chloride, the acid anhydride, ester, and amides. A couple of other ones that are important, acyl phosphates, as you might imagine, are biologically important. Uh, thioesters will also run across from time to time, uh, although we're not going to delve into them in any great detail in this module. So let's take a look at some of the properties of our carboxylic acids. What we're going to find is that any reactions that we do under acidic conditions, uh, we always protonate the carbonyl oxygen first. This oxygen is the most basic site on all of our carboxylic acid derivatives. Even though we have a lone pair of electrons on nitrogen here, those are actually tied up because of this resonance form uh, of this carboxylic acid derivative, it actually contributes quite a bit to the overall structure. In the case of esters, uh, we also have one of the lone pairs is tied up in a resonance form. So the carbonyl oxygen is actually the most basic site. So whenever we're in a situation where we have to protonate a carboxylic acid derivative, we're going to protonate that carbonyl oxygen. That's the site of protonation. So let's take a little look at the properties. Uh, acyl chlorides, these things are very polar. Uh, they don't have any hydrogen bond donating abilities, but they can be hydrogen bond acceptors. As we'll find out, this is kind of deceiving. Is it soluble in water? The answer is no, but you know what? It doesn't actually matter because this thing is so reactive, it just reacts with water. So even if we could get it to dissolve, it won't. It will react with water. These things have acrid piercing odors, and it may actually be the carboxylic acid you're smelling uh, rather than the acid chloride because it will react with any kind of moisture in your nose. Acid anhydrides, also quite reactive. These, uh, like the acid chlorides, the carbonyl carbon is very electrophilic. Uh, these things are also polar. Uh, they're hydrogen bond acceptors, but not hydrogen bond donators. They're not very water soluble. They can be readily dissolved in organic solvents. They're a little bit less reactive than the acyl chlorides, but they're still quite reactive. Esters we've seen, we, we saw that in the last reaction. These things are polar in this area, but it depends now on the R groups. If you have long R groups, these things can be quite nonpolar and actually good solvents. Uh, they're not typically very soluble in water. 
Uh, and these things actually have uh, pleasant, pleasant fragrances, as we've already mentioned. We've looked at carboxylic acids quite a bit already. Uh, amides. Amides are complex hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Uh, surprisingly, the nitrogen is in a terrific hydrogen bond acceptor because that lone pair of electrons is tied up in a resonance structure in which we have a lot of carbon-nitrogen double bond character. These things are very high boiling. They can be water-soluble if they're small enough and we don't have any other uh, alkyl groups on the nitrogen. Uh, the last carboxylic acid derivative, which isn't obvious and we'll talk about at the end, are these nitriles. They are carboxylic acids and uh, we'll see uh, that when we take a look, closer look at them. They're, they're quite polar compounds and they make very nice uh, polar aprotic solvents. So acetonitrile is a solvent that we use quite often. Uh, it's fairly high boiling and it's also very polar, but it, it, we think of it as aprotic because the protons on that carbon are uh, not very acidic at all. We name esters simply by taking the carboxylate and then indicating the other side. Uh, so in this instance, we have acetate. This is the acetate. And we have an ethyl group. We can make this from acetic acid and ethyl alcohol. Quite often the common names dominate. So here we have malonic acid and the diethyl ester of malonic acid is called diethyl malonate. Uh, again, so we should be able to name these ethyl acetate terp butyl propanate. So notice that the terp butyl group is the group that's bonded to the oxygen and the propanate talks about the carboxylate portion. So here we have again acetate and a vinyl group, uh, isopentyl, there's the isopentyl group, and pentanoate, here is the pentanoate. Just, just more of the same in this case, parachlorobenzoate, we're, we're talking about the parachloro, and there's the benzoate, and it is the methyl ester of parachlorobenzoic acid. Naming amides, a uh, little bit different. We take our root from our acid, and then we just add amide. So acetic acid, we can react with nitrogen, and it becomes acetamide. Benzoic acid, we react it uh, to form the amide. We have benzamide. As you might guess, uh, when we, we, we just take whatever the carboxylic acid is and take ic acid away and put uh, carboxamide, in this case, cyclohexane carboxamide. We often have substitution on the nitrogen, and we indicate that by using N as our locant. So we have, in this case, acetamide, but we have a methyl group bonded on the nitrogen. And in this case, we have NN dimethyl because we have a meth two methyl groups on the nitrogen. We've replaced both of the hydrogens with methyl groups. Acid anhydrides are named by replacing acid with anhydride. Acetic acid, you can notice that we have the acyl group on both sides. We call this acetic anhydride. Uh, Cynic acid, in this case, we can form a cyclic anhydride. We just call it succinic anhydride. Uh, asymmetrical anhydrides are named by listing the acids alphabetically. So this would be acetic benzoic anhydride. I will tell you that this situation doesn't actually arise very often. For the most part, you're going to have symmetrical uh, acid anhydrides. Naming acid halides, uh, all we have to do is call it the cyclohexane carboxylic acid, and then we just add chloride. Uh, we could call it cyclohexane carboxylic acid chloride, 
or cyclohexane carbonyl chloride. Both are acceptable. Often you'll you'll just replace the ic acid with YL, uh, but so benzoic acid becomes benzoyl chloride. We also it's acceptable to just call this benzoic acid chloride. Nitriles are named by replacing the suffix ic acid or oic acid with O nitrile. So acetic acid, acetonitrile, benzoic acid, benzonitrile. And then we're going to stop there.